Good afternoon, class. Uh, we're going to continue our video lecture series for emergency medical responder for Wilcox County. Uh, lecture five is going to be involving lifting and moving of patients. Uh, this is critical. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time on Wednesday night going through practical application of this. So pay special attention to these slides, especially the ones involving pictures. As an EMR or emergency medical responder, you must analyze the situation, quickly evaluate the patient, carry out effective life-saving emergency medical procedures. Uh, these procedures will include lifting and moving patients and using the proper equipment to do so. General guidelines when it comes to moving a patient. Uh, do no further harm. Uh, Make sure when you're moving a patient that you're not causing any harm. Uh, move the patient only when it's necessary to do so. If you can treat the patient where they're at, treat them where they're at. Uh, move the patient as few times as possible. Uh, that goes back again to if you can treat them where they are, treat them where they are. Uh, it's better to move the patient once to the EMS stretcher instead of move them from the bathroom floor to the living room to the kitchen back to the couch and then to the stretcher. It's best just to wait and move them one time and be done with it. Move the patient's body as a unit and not uh, pulling arm here, leg here. Just treat the body as a unit, move them at once, and don't cause them any more harm. Use proper lifting and moving techniques. Uh, this can prevent you from being injured as well as injuring the patient. Have one rescue in charge of giving commands. If you've got two or three people trying to give commands to everybody, it's going to end bad and somebody's going to get hurt. All right, uh, delay moving the patient if possible until additional EMS personnel arrive. Uh, this has a couple of reasons. Sometimes they may have different plans than you do. Um, they're going to be the ones taking the patient to the hospital, so sometimes it's a good idea to wait for their input. Uh, treat the patient before moving unless the patient's not safe. That goes again back to us saying try to treat the patient where they're at. Don't move them unless it's absolutely necessary. Don't step over the patient. Uh, this can be dangerous for a lot of reasons. Anything that you have on your shoes can wind up on the patient. Uh, if the patient suddenly moves, they could knock you off balance and you could fall and injure yourself or injure the patient by falling on top of them. Uh, explain to the patient what's happening. Uh, they may be disoriented, but it's always good to tell them what's going on so at least if they are aware, they can you know, have an idea of what's going on and just not be in the dark. All right, some general guidelines again. Um, know what your limitations are, guys. Don't try to lift somebody that's too heavy for you to pick up. Uh, keep yourself balanced when you're lifting. Get yourself a good, firm footing. And just be prepared to lift. Um, the fourth point here is a error. Uh, it says use your back. The truth is you never want to use your back. You want to use your legs. You want to keep your back straight. Uh, and you also want to keep your arms close to your body. Uh, that prevents you from getting a back injury. All right, let's talk about the recovery position. Uh, this is a great position to put patients in that have not suffered trauma but are unconscious. Uh, on their side, you can see in the figure on the right-hand side of the slide how they're laying. This position helps keep the airway open. It also allows secretions to drain from the mouth naturally. It's just a great overall position. Uh, one to really keep in mind for anybody that's unconscious that has not sustained trauma. All right, body mechanics. Uh, improper lifting or moving techniques can result in the injury of you or the patient. Use your legs, do not use your back. Um, Improper lifting and moving techniques results in more on-the-job injuries for EMS and fire personnel than anything else combined. Uh, 
that's something you just have to keep in mind. Learn how to lift and do it every time, even if it's something light. Use proper body mechanics. Keep your back straight as you lift. Lift without twisting your body. Get a solid stance and a firm footing before lifting. Assess the weight of your patient. Know your limitations. Again, if there's somebody that is too heavy for you to lift, call for extra help. Don't try to be the hero. All you're going to do is wind up hurting yourself or injuring the patient because you can drop them or anything else. Always call for additional assistance if you need it. Uh, communicate with other members of the lifting team. Always have a single person that's going to be the team leader and calling the shots for the lift. Practice lifts and moves regularly. That way when you're on the scene, you're not trying to remember how to do it. Practice makes perfect guys, and this includes when you're lifting and moving patients. Emergency movements of patients. Move a patient if the following situations are present. Danger of fire, explosion, or structural collapse exists. Hazardous materials are present. The emergency scene cannot be protected. It is otherwise impossible to gain access to others that need life-saving care. The patient is in is a cardiac arrest victim. Uh, any of these situations, you've just got to get them out of the way. Everything else is secondary to getting them away from whatever imminent threat to their life that they exist. Now let's talk about the closed drag. Uh, this is the simplest way to move a patient in an emergency situation. Uh, you're going to grab the patient's clothing around the neck and shoulder area. Rest the patient's head in your arms, and you're going to drag the patient out of danger. Uh, take a look at the uh, photo on the right-hand side, and it'll show you how a closed drag is performed. Cardiac arrest patients in a closed drag. If the room the cardiac arrest victim is located and is too small for the emergency team to provide emergency care, the patient must be moved into a more open space. Immediately grab the patient by the uh, clothing as described in the previous slide. Drag the patient to a desired location. Begin CPR. Uh, it's just best to go ahead and move them into an open environment. That way the entire rescue team can get inside and provide care effectively. Blanket drag. Use this drag if the patient is not clothed or is dressed in delicate clothing. Place the patient on a blanket or rug. Grasp the blanket or rug and drag the patient to safety. Um, this is used, can be very effective. Uh, if you have to roll the patient onto the blanket or rug, that's fine. It's, it's just a very effective technique, very similar to the closed drag. Emergency drag is continued. Arm to arm drag. This is one of my personal favorites. Uh, just place your hand under the patient's armpits from the back and grasp the patient's forearms. Stand and lift the patient's upper body and drag the lower extremities while walking backwards. It's very effective. Uh, you do have to have some upper body strength uh, to be able to grasp the patient's wrists and hold them in place. Um, however, if you have that upper body strength and are able to stand up, it's a very easy drag. This is the firefighter drag. Um, it can be effective, however, it's also kind of involved by setting it up and it's also a little bit awkward. So the process is to tie the patient's hands together. You can use anything, whether it be a belt, a tie, a piece of cloth, I mean, whatever. Uh, then you get down on your hands and knees and straddle the patient. You put the patient's tied hands around your neck and drag the patient across the floor by crawling. I said it works. It's kind of awkward. Uh, we'll demonstrate in class on Wednesday night. And you guys can tell what you think about it. Alright, so an emergency drag from a vehicle is pretty self-explanatory. Um, you're going to use a similar technique to 
dragging a patient, you know, from the floor. Uh, a few slight differences, though. If you get one rescue where you're going to grasp the patient under the arms and cradle the patient's head in your arms, uh, you're going to pull the patient down and into a horizontal position as you ease them to the ground. This is just going to kind of help protect their neck and spinal column, just in case they did have an injury. drag from vehicle this is two rescue work it's basically the same as a one rescue where you're just going to um, be using two rescuers and you're going to control the spine a little bit better all right this is going to be a two-person extremity carry uh, it's very effective move quickly uh, both people are facing forward as uh, so a rescuer one is going to reach their arms under the armpits and grab the patient's wrist Rescuer 2 reaches around the legs and grasps the patient behind the knees. The two rescuers then stand and walk away. Uh, like I said, it's very effective. Uh, it does require upper body strength for both rescuers. As long as you can maintain your grip, you should be good to go. Two-person seat carry. The rescuers kneel on the opposite sides of the patient near the patient's hips. The rescuer raises the patient to a seated position and link arms behind the patient's back. Rescuers place the other arm behind the patient's back and then link them with each other. No equipment is required for this uh, carry. Very effective. All right, carries for non-ambulatory patients. Uh, you're gonna go over the cradle and arms carry first. Uh, this can be used by one rescuer to carry a child or small adult. Um, depends on rescuer size and strength. I can carry a pretty normal size adult in this position. Um, other people can only carry a small child. It just, just depends on your size and your strength. Uh, process is going to be the same though. You kneel beside the patient and place one arm around the back and one arm under the thigh. You stand and lift, rolling the patient into the hollow formed by the arms and the chest, and you stand up and walk away as normal. All right, uh, two-person chair carry. This is one of my personal favorites. Um, most people have sturdy chairs in their house. One rescuer stands behind the seated patient and grabs the back of the chair. Rescuer where one tilts the chair back so the patient, I mean, so the second rescuer can grab the front of the chair legs. Rescuer one gives the command to lift and walk away. He said it's a very easy um, carry. Uh, you have equipment that you can use that's already in the house. It's a really good way to improvise. This is the pack strap carry. Uh, I'm not a big fan. I just uh, find it to be a little bit awkward. Especially if the rescuer is a little bit shorter and the person being rescued is taller. It just doesn't work out very well most of the time. Uh, however, it is an approved lift or carry and we'll go over it in class Wednesday. Basic ideas to back into the patient as they're standing. Grab the patient's wrists and cross the arms over your chest. Pull the patient onto your back. Bend forward to lift the patient. Stand up and walk away. All right, the direct ground lift is another one that can be a little bit awkward. Uh, it can be used to move the patient from the ground or the floor to the stretcher. Used only for patients that have not sustained major traumatic injuries. Uh, we'll go over this in class. It's just not generally recommended because it results in frequent injuries of the patient as well as the rescuer. Transferring a patient from a bed to a stretcher. Uh, place the stretcher next to the bed. Loosen the bottom sheet underneath the patient or log roll the patient onto a blanket. Reach across the stretcher and grasp the sheet and blanket firmly at the patient's head, chest, hips, and knees. Slide the patient across the bed on the stretcher. It's pretty straightforward. It's an easy way to move a patient from a bed to a stretcher, especially if it's a ambulance stretcher that's adjustable and you can uh, put it even with the bed. Right, 
walking assist for ambulatory patients. Uh, this is the one person walking assist. It's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, so initially, you're just going to help the patient stand. You're going to have the patient place one arm around your neck and hold the patient's wrist. Put your free arm around the waist and help the patient walk. Now you can see in the um, photo on the right hand side how simple it is. It's really nothing to explain. Walking assist for ambulatory patients. Uh, this is going to be just be the two walking assists. The same concept as one person assist except there are two rescuers, one on each side. This is useful if the patient can't bear weight. Um, the two rescuers are able to completely support the patient's weight. Makes it pretty, uh, pretty easy on the patient. Alright, this is a wheeled ambulance stretcher. It's one of the most common EMS devices. It can be raised or lowered to different heights. It has belts to secure the patient. Stretchers can be rolled or carried by two or four people. Uh, if you're going to be carrying it, you want to get one person on each corner at minimum. That would be a four person. If it's on a flat ground, two people can manage it pretty effectively uh, just by wheeling it across the ground. All right, portable stretchers. Uh, they're used when wheel stretchers cannot be moved into small space. They're smaller and lighter than a traditional stretcher. They can be carried the same way as a wheeled stretcher. They're often placed on top of a wheel chest uh, stretcher after the patient is extricated. Um, just depends on the model of the stretcher. One, like in the picture, can't necessarily be placed on a standard stretcher, but others can. All right, stair chairs are very effective. They're one of my favorite devices. Um, it's a portable moving device that is used to carry a patient in a seated position. They're especially useful in patients that are more comfortable sitting upright. I use them a lot for patients that are in severe restorative stress, as laying somebody back that's in severe distress generally is not a comfortable or uh, even a position that they can be in because of what they got going on. Um, they're generally small, lightweight, and easy to carry, although that's subjective. Some of the newer models are just extremely heavy, and um, they're getting so heavy they're almost difficult to carry up the stairs, or, or else I'm just getting old. I'm not sure what it is. Um, it's not indicated for use of patients that have sustained major trauma is one of the drawbacks for it, so it's basically just used for medical patients. Mobilization devices. All right. Long backboards are probably the most common immobilization device. They're generally made of plastic or fiberglass. Some are still made of wood. Uh, patients must be secured with straps onto the long spine board if it's going to be used as a mobilization device. If the patient has a back or neck injury, the head should also be immobilized. Uh, we'll go over all this in class on Wednesday night. Uh, this should be something you're already pretty familiar with. All right, uh, short backboard devices. Uh, they're used to immobilize the head and spine of patients that are found in a sitting position. These can be useful if somebody's uh, sitting upright in a vehicle and you do suspect a spinal injury. Uh, they're usually made of plastic. Some are uh, like a vest-like garment. This uh, picture is called a KED. We'll go over that in class on Wednesday night. A lot of people don't use them very often, but if you use them appropriately, they are very effective. Now, this is a uh, scoop stretcher, very useful device. Um, they can be split into two and slid under the patient without actually making, without actually moving the patient. Um, Major benefits are if, say, you have a hip injury or something that you can't really log roll somebody effectively on, you can just slide that up under the patient. Uh, it's also good for confined, uh, confined spaces. It's just not indicated for use of people with head or a suspected spinal injury. It just doesn't provide enough support for those patients. In an emergency with limited equipment, Improvise by using wide, sturdy planks, doors, 
ironing boards, surfboards as pictured, or basically anything that uh, you can immobilize somebody on to. Uh, that's a huge thing with being an emergency medical responder is you have to be able to improvise, work with what you got, make it happen. It just makes everything work out better. All right, treatment of patients with head or spinal injuries. Anytime a patient has sustained a major traumatic injury, suspect the patient has sustained a spinal injury until it's ruled out. The EMR should be prepared to assist other providers in immobilizing the patient. Flying a cervical collar. Cervical collars are used to prevent excess movement of the head and neck. Soft C collars do not provide sufficient report for trauma patients. Many different types of C collars are available. C collars should be placed before the patient is placed on a backboard. Using backboards. If you suspect a spinal injury, the uh, patient should be transported on a long backboard. When placing a patient on a backboard, you should observe the following. Move the patient as a unit. Transport the patient face up. Keep the head and neck of the, in the neuter, neutral position. Be sure everyone understands what it is, what is to be done before this movement. Be sure only one rescue is giving commands. Um, if you've got multiple rescuers trying to give commands, things are not going to go smooth. People are going to do things you shouldn't be doing, and somebody's going to wind up getting hurt. This is the movement technique used to move a patient onto a backboard. It requires a team of four. This movement technique is the best option for all patients with a suspected spinal injury. All patient movement commands must be made by the leader. Strata lift. Uh, this can be used to place a patient on a backboard if you do not have enough space to perform a log roll. This requires five rescuers. One of the head and neck, one to straddle the shoulders and the chest, one to straddle the hips and thighs, one to straddle the legs, and one to slide the backboard under the patient. Uh, this lift can be effective. It just requires a lot of personnel and it requires a lot of coordination. Um, I wouldn't recommend it unless it's absolutely necessary, unless you're in a super tight area and you, this is your only option. All right, guys, let's get through a summary of uh, this chapter. Uh, general guidelines for moving patients. Do no further harm to the patient. Move the patient only if it's necessary. Move the patient's body as a unit. Use proper lifting and moving techniques. Have one rescuer give commands when moving a patient. All right, unconscious patients that have not sustained trauma should be placed in a recovery position. If a patient is on the floor or ground during an emergency situation, you may have to drag them away from the scene if they're in a life-threatening situation. Do not lift or move a patient with a possible spinal injury unless they must be moved to prevent further injury or death. Common equipment for moving patients includes wheel stretchers, portable stretchers, scoop stretchers, long backboards, and short backboards. A cervical collar prevents excessive movement of the head and the neck. Log rolling is the primary technique used to move a patient onto a long backboard. Once the patient has been secured to the backboard, the head and the neck must be immobilized if this is being utilized because of a spinal injury. All right, guys, this concludes uh, the fifth lecture. Uh, this also concludes the first section of the class. If you guys have any questions between now and Wednesday, please contact me. Uh, you should have your reading assignments. If you need those, please feel free to reach out. Um, other than that, I'll see you guys Wednesday. We're going to go over a lot of the um, lifting and moving techniques in person. So wear something comfortable. And uh, see you guys Wednesday.